If you're watching this, you probably know that Corydoras eggs take a few days to hatch. And during that time, the greatest risk to their survival is usually fungus. There are a few common and not at all deranged methods of keeping fungus off the eggs, but today I want to show you something a little unconventional and definitely out of the box. Or to be more specific, out of the water. I got this idea from a viewer who shared with me that they've had some success storing killifish eggs, which have a fairly long incubation period, in a Ziploc bag and covered by a damp paper towel. And I wondered, what if that could work for quarries? It's absurd, I love it, and I have to try it. I started with some eggs from Scleromystax barbatus. I've found their eggs to be unusually sensitive, and they also like to lay them in big clumps that almost guarantee a fungus problem if you don't get ahead of it. I don't usually collect eggs with a razor blade, but for these big clumps I've found it helpful. I'm still getting the technique down, but I only scrambled one egg here and that's an improvement. I took those eggs and transferred them to a folded paper towel that I had saturated with clean, dechlorinated water. I purposely did not use tank water. I'm sure the eggs have plenty of contaminants on them, but I figured, why risk more by using tank water? I wrung out the paper towel, by the way. It's damp, but not soaked by any stretch. Looking good so far. They all appear to be healthy. I left the eggs exposed and carefully slid the paper towel into a Ziploc bag. The idea here is that even though the eggs aren't submerged in water, they won't dehydrate because the air in the bag will quickly reach 100% relative humidity. There are blood vessels all around the perimeter of the egg membrane, and they should be able to draw oxygen right out of the air. Let's see what happens. 24 hours later, still no signs of trouble. I couldn't tell if they were growing, but they didn't seem to be dying either. I was actually surprised to find that few, if any, eggs were showing signs of infertility or decay. That's unusual in my experience. Another day later, this is where things got weird. This is a fish where, in the low 70s, the eggs start hatching toward the end of about four days. I was surprised again to find that I could see what looked like well-developed fry doing backflips and somersaults like they were about to hatch out. I have never seen this before at 48 hours. In hindsight, this might have been a mistake, but I decided to keep the eggs incubating until the start of the fourth day. My thinking was, maybe the fry really do develop this early and I've just never noticed it better to stick with conventional timing. On that fourth day, they were, as far as I could tell, still alive and kicking. I carefully transferred them to a clean fry tray and watched closely over the next hours to see what would happen after being resubmerged in water. I figured at this point that if something was going to go wrong, this is probably where it would happen. I will say, the eggs had an unusual look to them. Just before they hatch, quarry eggs typically have a darker color to them. You can still see the fry inside, but the membranes are usually much more opaque. These were fairly transparent. As far as I could tell, though, the transition back to water didn't do any harm. Over the next 12 hours or so, I found perfectly normal-looking fry. Unfortunately, though, only about half of the eggs hatched. My mind immediately went to the developed fry I had seen on that second day. My guess was they were ready much earlier than I had planned for, they missed some critical window, expended too much energy, and now were unfortunately expired. So I told myself I need to resubmerge the eggs a little earlier. Next I tried with the eggs of some Corydora schultzi. This is one of those species similar to Aeneas that plaster a large number of smaller eggs all over the tank with a relatively low fertility rate. This is another case where fungus is often a problem. This time I used a circular cotton pad to collect the eggs, which were, as I mentioned, more numerous. I used the circular pad because it would fit nicely in a hard-shelled container. After the last time, I told myself to switch to something solid because I may have squished a couple of eggs while running around shoving the Ziploc into people's faces and yelling, look, they're not dead. I may have. The incubation period went about the same as the Barbatus. Three days in, I could faintly see the mottled yellow color of fry developing inside. They weren't as active with the backflips, but I decided this is where we'll stop this time. Three days in and probably two full days before standard hatch time. I was hoping that the cotton pad would sink and make this easy, but no luck. It wasn't saturated enough, and I couldn't really press the air out without damaging the eggs, so I had to pick them out. A couple of days later, the fry hatched out, and accounting for lower initial fertility, I would say I saw a higher hatch rate than I ever have for this species. The only downside I could see was a bit higher percentage of fry with irreparable curvature, or what I, in official parlance, call goners. This is something that can happen if fry spend too long in the egg without hatching. This is a line-bred color morph, so to some degree, I wrote off the high incidence to bad genetics. I've seen it before. But still, I wanted to try one more time and see if another day earlier might make a difference. For take three, I used eggs from some wild loxazonas. 
The eggs were larger, firmer, and more typical in number. I used the circular pad and the hard-shelled container again, and their incubation went just as the first two trials. I transferred the eggs at 48 hours, and this time, developing fry weren't nearly as visible. As I transferred the eggs to a fry tray, I noticed something really surprising. Even two days later, the eggs were still pliable and adhesive. I was actually able to re-adhere some of them to the tray walls. And this is very unusual. Cory eggs, in my experience, typically lose their adhesiveness over the first 12 hours or so, and the membrane hardens noticeably in the days after that. I always try to re-adhere eggs when I can, so this was cool, but it also made me rethink the hatching issue from the Barbatus. For the fry to hatch, the egg membranes need to weaken and rupture. Retaining elasticity would make that difficult. Maybe the issue wasn't that the fry missed a window of opportunity to hatch, but instead, the eggs didn't spend enough time in water to change some tensile property that would ever allow the fry to break through. If that's true, that would be a real downside to this method. I hoped that having yet another day in water would help mitigate that effect. Over the next days, I saw yet again an incredible viability rate in the eggs. The percentage of eggs that clearly held developing fry has been higher using this method than I've ever seen. With extra time in the water, the hatch rate was also much higher than before. There were only two or three eggs that never hatched. Unfortunately, I still found an unusual percentage of fry with the curvature issue. I really believe now that this is something that will happen more often as a direct result of using this incubation method. I've been watching the healthy fry closely, and as they grow I haven't seen any ill effects pop up later. So where does that leave us? Knowing there are downsides, why would you want to do this? Why would you resort to these nigh heretical methods? One thing you can certainly take away from this is that if you find and need to pull eggs but you don't have time to get them set up with methylene blue and whatnot because you have to go to bed or you have to go to work, clearly you can keep them humid and sealed up for a while until you have time to deal with them. That's good to know. Another practical application that occurs to me is you might do this if you simply can't keep eggs in water. Maybe you struggle with low hatch rates because of calcification from hard water. This might avoid it. Now it does occur to me that storing the eggs in humid air might be more relatable to RO water, and that sudden exposure of the eggs to the chemistry and mineral content of water might have some shocking impact, but I didn't notice any. My water isn't that hard, relatively speaking, but I didn't notice any issues. You might also have some unbeatable fungus working against you. Maybe you've got cordyceps from The Last of Us and nothing seems to keep it away. This might help that too. Lastly, you might even be able to ship eggs like this as long as the transit time is in the 1-3 to three day range, or even 4 if you can accept higher losses. Either way, I wouldn't say this is something anyone should do, but apparently it's something that you can do, and I'll leave the rest to your interpretation. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.